Hello everyone and welcome to an all new episode of Secrets in Dragon Ball Games. I was recently watching a playthrough of Tenkaichi 2 by a fellow DBZ YouTuber Dado Doya. He was playing through Raditz's What If Story when suddenly this happened. Did he just, did he just, oh it still hits the earth? Even if it doesn't hit Raditz it still hits the earth? Does any other Dragon Ball game even do that? At first, I was caught off guard. I guess I've been playing so much of Tenkaichi 3 that I forgot this was even a thing. For whatever reason, this feature was removed in Tenkaichi 3. In 3, that planet destruction effect would only trigger if you landed your ultimate. Whereas, if you miss it, you will get an impact-like effect with the screen going all white for a second. But there's no destruction. Why did they remove it? I... I honestly have no clue. I mean, I would love to see it make a comeback. In fact, in the first gameplay trailer, we actually see Frieza throwing his supernova at the ground, which causes the planet to implode. So yeah, it might actually make a comeback. But that's besides the point right now, let's get back to the main thing. I wanted to see which other ultimates would trigger this effect in BT2. I chose Kid Boost Planet Burst Attack, a move that's notable for actually blowing up a planet. But to my surprise, it... It didn't do anything. The Earth was still intact. It was definitely strange. An attack that actually managed to blow up a planet in the show doesn't do anything in the game. Alright, maybe it's just an oversight. Let's try Frieza's ultimate, the Death Ball. Strange. Another attack that was shown to blow up a planet in the show doesn't even leave a dent here. Alright, we have two oversights. But surely the Big Bang Kamehameha times 100, the strongest attack in existence by this point, would manage to destroy... It won't. Yeah, not even Omega's negative energy ball. I don't know if the devs did this intentionally, but based on everything we've seen so far, it would appear that Goku's spirit bomb is the only attack that manages to destroy a planet if said attack hits the ground. But wait, it gets even better. While attempting to break down the planet destruction mechanic, I discovered something even more brilliant. I noticed that Dodo only gathered energy for the spirit bomb once. Here's why that's interesting. Interesting. If you wanted to cause the planet destruction effect, you would usually have to gather energy at least two times. But as we've seen with the footage he showcased, it only took one charge. That's when I had that little light bulb moment. What if the planet destruction mechanic is also tied to the power level of the character that's on the receiving end? Let me explain. On its own, planet Earth gets immediately destroyed by a single charge, i.e. when you throw the spirit bomb directly at the ground. But as soon as there's someone to absorb some of that damage, for example, Reddit's, the number of charges needed to initiate the planet destruction effect goes up to two. But it doesn't stop at 2. Oh no. If you choose a much stronger character than Reddit's, for example, Super Boo, the number of charges will rise to 3. And if you select someone even stronger than Super Boo, the destruction effect simply won't even trigger. The logic being, the character is so strong on his own, he can just tank the attack without causing any damage to the surroundings. And considering I've selected Omega Shenron, it makes perfect sense. He's arguably the strongest non-fused character in game. I think this is another instance of the power level slash progression mechanic. A mechanic that's quite celebrated within the Tenkaichi community. The best example would probably be Super Armor, which is given to certain powerful characters. And depending on your character's strength, it would take anywhere between 1 to 6 consecutive attacks to break that armor. We've already covered it pretty extensively in previous videos, so let's just get back to the main point. I do believe that everything we've seen so far points in the direction of it being a power level based mechanic. And to further prove that this mechanic is dependent on the power level of a character, we have Mr. Satan, the weakest character in the game lore wise. And can you guess how many charges he can tank? Zero. I'm, I'm not really.
You like dragons? I like dragons. We all like dragons. Heck, 2024 is the year of the dragon. And guess what? Dragon City has over a thousand unique dragons for you to play as. Create your own dragon empire by collecting, hatching, and evolving a wide array of dragons, including dragons of some of your favorite YouTubers. Is that... Mr. Beast? Design and customize your dream city with magical habitats, enchanting buildings, and decorations of your choice. Looking for something more challenging? Dragon City offers thrilling PvP battles that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Did you know that you can breed dragons in this game? By combining flame, nature, electric, and various other elements, you'll be able to breed and create even more unique dragons. In short, the possibilities are endless. Take your newborn dragon and unleash your powerful dragon skills and strategies to conquer challenging quests and events like the wizard's hollow so what are you waiting for it's completely free and available for both your android and ios devices download dragon city today by clicking the top link in the description or simply scan the qr code and receive a special bundle with 15,000 food 30,000 gold and the extremely rare black metal dragon in short, the stronger a character is, the more spirit bomb charges you'll need to trigger a planet's destruction. I guess this was an experimental feature in Tenkaichi 2, considering it's completely gone in 3. I also find it interesting how Cell Spirit Bomb doesn't do shit. Androids in the games are usually depicted as characters who are unable to utilize one of the game's most integral mechanics, the key charge, which does make sense with them being artificial beings and whatnot, rather than emitting an explosive aura from their bodies, as is the case with other characters when they charge their key, they're either completely unable to utilize this core mechanic, such as the case with Tenkaichi games, where the game gradually does the charging process for them, or the game gives them the ability to charge their energy, with the slight exception of not manifesting an aura, like characters typically would. This way, they can make them play like everyone else while also acknowledging the lore behind it. These two methods are the most commonly used approaches for handling the charging of androids. However, there's also a third one. The third approach is completely unique to only one game, Ultimate Tenkaichi. Well, technically too, it first made an appearance in Raging Blast 2, but I think it looks much more cinematic in Ultimate Tenkaichi. So what's so special about this third approach? Well... That's right, instead of emitting an aura like everyone else, they straight up emit electricity. You know, cause they're robots, and what do robots need in order to operate? Electricity. These electrical surge is unique to the android, sure, but there's one tiny exception. Metal Cooler. After all, he is a mass-produced robo-clone of Cooler. The electrical surge effect not only highlights their mechanical side, which separates them from the rest of the cast, but it also adds a new creative way they can charge their energy. Not saying that the way they were handled previously was bad, no. I just appreciate whenever they make some creative changes that can also also function well in terms of lore. I know 17 and 18 aren't entirely mechanical, but they're almost always grouped together and play roughly the same as the other androids. So yeah, Ultimate Tenkaichi would mark the last time we would see this feature. Speaking of Ultimate Tenkaichi, did you know that this game has zero correlation to the actual Tenkaichi games? I mean, the first giveaway was in the actual gameplay, which is essentially a glorified rock-paper-scissors simulator. Or, as certain people like to call it, rock-paper-scissors the game. Besides that, the game's original Japanese name doesn't even include sparking in its title. It's called Omega Blast, which makes it sound more like a Raging Blast spin-off than a Tenkaichi game. And considering how many assets of Raging Blast 2 were reused, it's more fitting to consider it a Raging Blast type game, if anything. Fun fact, the name Ultimate Tenkaichi is a result of a fan poll back in 2011. The fans were given five choices, and to no surprise, the one that had Tenkaichi in its name won. 
Shocker. So yeah, that's why the game bears the name Tenkaichi in its title, despite not actually being a Tenkaichi game. But there is one specific feature from this game that's going to make a comeback in the upcoming Tenkaichi game, i.e. Sparking Zero. The initial Sparking Zero V-Jump issue highlighted dynamic weather changes as one of the game's prominent features. It seems that the weather effects will change as a result of an intense transformation in key charging. Although weather changes aren't triggered by transformations and key charging in Ultimate Tenkaichi, they do occur under different circumstances. I personally am unsure about what those exact circumstances are. At first, I thought you would only trigger the weather change when you launched a strong enough ultimate. But seeing I was able to get the exact same effect with one of Android 17 super attacks, I'm kind of left confused here. I tried to trigger it with Android 17 again and this time, it didn't work. But you know what's even more funny? On my second attempt, Vegeta's Big Bang attack, which was also previously able to trigger the weather change, it yielded no results. I even tried skimming over the official guidebook, but there was no explanation given. I'll be honest, I'm glad this feature is making a comeback in Sparking Zero. It might not have been on my top 10 things I'd love to see in Sparking Zero, but it's a welcome addition nonetheless. It makes the battles feel more cinematic, which was kind of the whole thing Ultimate Tenkaichi was going for. In Tenkaichi 3, your character will perform their idle animation if left motionless for roughly 3 seconds. Technically, they're taunts, or at least they were at one point, unlike Tenkaichi 3 where the only way to trigger taunts is to remain idle. The first Tenkaichi game had a slightly different approach. In the first game, you could essentially spam him to your heart's content. Granted, there isn't any benefit, but hey, at least you'll annoy your opponent. Many of these taunts are shared between characters, even this one. Come on, you scum! It fits Vegeta's character so perfectly that you'd assume it was tailor-made for him. And then you get to Android 17, who does the exact same thing. I mean, it still could have been made with Vegeta in mind. Unfortunately, I can't consider it as a unique taunt since other characters also use it. As far as unique taunts go, we actually have a few. Nam does his honorable bow. Arali attempts to distract you, I think. General Blue does something... General Blue-ish? <laughs> now, when it comes to Boo forms, each version of Boo comes with its own unique animation, except Evil Boo. Fat Boo makes a mocking face, Kid Boo does a little post snap stretch, which is quite fitting, and then there's Super Boo, who attempts to recreate that one shot from the show. I say attempt because he's still missing the magazine soda combo. Remember how I said there's no benefit to using taunts? Well, you see, I didn't lie. But I also didn't tell the truth. There's one particular taunt that could maybe be considered useful in a 1 out of 100 sort of way. Meet Cyberman. His taunt is simply playing dead. Kinda like that one time in the show where he played dead and then… yeah. You might be wondering how this taunt can be deemed useful. Well, it all boils down to one thing, hitboxes. By falling to the ground, he lowers his hitbox, making it slightly more challenging to land hits. Most attacks will probably connect anyway, but there is also an off chance that you perform the most perfect Cyberman dodge of all time. No, he actually dodged. I know. This next one was enthusiastically requested by a fellow viewer of the channel named Thomas. He wanted me to talk about a specific feature from one of the lesser known Budokai games, Shin Budokai Another Road. Shin Budokai is a series of Budokai-like games released for the PSP. They operate on the exact same engine that was used for the PS2 Budokai games, albeit with some minor tweaks and new mechanics. One of those new mechanics is the Aura Burst Charge. So, what exactly is Aura Burst Charge or ABC for short? ABC is an enhanced state you can enter when you press right and left shoulder pads on your PSP, and each character has different effects during their ABC. Some get massive stat boosts, allowing them to do more damage, some generate health, and others have their key costs significantly reduced or eliminated, and a few of them even get super armor. This ends. 
Your aura burst charges will change with each transformation, and most of the time, a stronger transformation has a weaker aura burst charge, most likely to balance things out. However, there are a few characters with some very unique ABC effects. Characters known for their regeneration hacks in the series have been given a very clever ABC effect. Rather than gaining power or key buffs, they regenerate their health instead. This includes Piccolo, Metacooler, Cell, and various forms of Boo. ABCs can only be activated once per round, which is a good thing. I don't think anyone would enjoy the whole regeneration spam, especially since it restores roughly one and a half bars of your health. Although there is one character who breaks this rule. Hey, it's me! Goku has the most unique ABC effect out of everyone. More specifically, his Kaioken version does. When activating Goku's ABC while he's in Kaioken, he receives a power boost at the cost of a small portion of his health. Not satisfied with the damage increase? Let's do it again. And again. Again. Damn, that sure was a lot of damage. I wonder how much health we got left. Oh. This is one of the very few games that takes Kaioken's toll on the body into account. Not even the original Budokai games did it. The only one that comes to mind is Xenoverse 2, and I really like what they did there. There's a move called Kaioken Assault, and with each hit you make while in Kaioken Assault mode, you spend a tiny bit of key, and most importantly, health. Huge shout out to Thomas for pointing this detail out. As a kid, I was always intrigued by Goku's spirit bomb in Budokai 3. Unlike Tenkaichi 3, where each saga has its own version of Goku, Budokai 3 features only one Goku. Personally, I don't have an issue with it. Still, there's one thing I couldn't understand. If there's only one version of Goku, how come there are two versions of the spirit bomb? You might think to yourself, given this game's capsule for skill approach, there should be two distinct capsules for each spirit bomb version. And that would make very much sense, but unfortunately, the game doesn't do that. There's only one capsule for Spirit Mom. Alright, so what about Goku's outfits? If he chose the Namek Saga outfit, he would perform Frieza Spirit Bomb, while selecting the end of Z outfit results in him performing the Kid Buu version. It does indeed make sense, but again, it doesn't work like that. Alright, then it must be random. What else could it be? It's not random, and in fact, there's quite a good explanation if you think about it. One simple thing that makes the Kid Boo Spirit Bomb particularly unique is the Super Saiyan transformation. So what if we just, you know, take the Super Saiyan capsule out? Could this be it? No! Huh. It's really that simple. In order to perform the Frieza Saga Spirit Bomb, we just have to remove all the Super Saiyan capsules, which leaves us with Kaioken. Wait, does that mean we can- Yes. Yes, we can. This game allows us to use the Spirit Bomb while in Kaioken, which is honestly pretty cool. Made even cooler by the fact that this would canonically happen to the show 14 years later. Man, Budokai 3 is on the roll. They predicted Broly vs. Gogeta, the Kaioken Spirit Bomb. What's next? Instant Transmission is an umbrella term used to describe every single teleporting technique in Tenkaichi 3. You have Goku, Perfect Cell, Metacooler, all of whom possesses the ability to use Instant Transmission. We don't have a problem with them, but then we get to someone like Janimba. The game calls this technique Instant Transmission, but I don't think Janimba uses Instant Transmission. He has his own unique dimension altering teleportation thingy. I don't think the devs had the necessary resources to accurately portray Janimba's teleportation technique back on the PS2. So they just slapped it with the good old instant transmission. We also have Kid Buu, another character whose teleportation technique has been slapped with the instant transmission label. His teleportation technique is based on the one that Kai's use, not instant transmission. But I think the devs were aware of that considering they gave him a unique animation. There's also Supreme Kai. The fusion? Can't remember his name. Uh, Kibidokai. Once we break him down, I think you'll definitely come to agree that the devs were well aware that all of these transportation techniques are different, but for whatever reason, they just categorized them as instant transmission. So, 
Kibitokai, another character whose teleportation technique was slapped with instant transmission. And you know what's worse? He even uses two fingers. He's obviously not supposed to be doing that. Supreme Kai, as every other Kai, uses the Kai teleportation technique, Kai Kai. Kai Kai doesn't require the use of fingers like instant transmission. They just kind of shout Kai Kai and immediately teleport. But the devs were aware of that, despite everything we just saw. How do I know? Well, let me play this footage with sound this time. Yep, they knew. I mean, it's evident by the fact he shouts Kai Kai before teleporting. They were definitely caught up on the lore. Cooler got a unique animation, and Kid Buu got one as well. And they straight up confirmed they were aware of it with Supreme Kai's Kai Kai. As to why they're all called instant transmission, I'm assuming it was just an honest oversight by whoever was in charge of writing the game's text. Either that, or they genuinely had no idea what to name all of these techniques. Did you know that? That Raging Blast 2 is the only game to feature Cell using a Gallic gun? Well, technically, there's also Ultimate Tenkai Chi, but that game ported everything from RB2, so I don't know if you want to count it. Anyways, this is something I only realized recently while working on this video. Just to be sure, I tested every single mainline Dragon Ball game. The Budokai series? No Gallic gun. The Tenkai Chi series? Nothing. Not even Burst Limit or RB1. As for the newer games, well, not only do they not have the Gallic Gun, Second Form Cell isn't even a playable character. These newer games tend to overlook the less iconic forms of characters, which is a bit unfortunate. They often emit Freeze as second and third forms and Cell's imperfect and semi-perfect forms. Really wonder what Sparking Zero will do. I believe they'll include them. I mean, it is a Tenkaichi game after all. Guess we'll just have to wait and see. For all of you wondering when Cell performed the Gallic Gun, it was during his battle with Super Vegeta. Also, I just found that scene hilarious. His Gallic Gun ended up doing more damage to him than it did to Vegeta. <laughs> Don't forget to check out Dragon City and download the game today using my special link in the description or simply scan the QR code to get a bunch of free goodies. Huge shout out to Dragon City for sponsoring this video.